Now, the part of Philippians 2 I'm going to focus in on is the very first part. And the subject matter of my sermon for tonight is actually a very simple one. I don't think you will be um, walking away necessarily with any brand new um, doctrine that you've learned today or with anything that um, you, could, you could say you hadn't necessarily already known. But we need to preach sermons like this from time to time to rejuvenate and reactivate ourselves and to, and to get ourselves back um, doing the things that we ought to be doing. And what I'm preaching about tonight is just basically about being a friend. Being a good friend and being able to honestly choose people out and to pick someone to be a friend to. And we'll get into this in a little bit, but you'll see how Really, tonight's sermon goes hand in hand with the, with the sermon we preached this morning. But let's get started here in Philippians 2. It's a great chapter. And there's going to be some things that are overlapped that I've been preaching on a little bit lately. But um, this is all going to be in application to being a friend. So um, let's, let's jump into the scripture here. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love... If any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. This is Paul admonishing them to be of one accord and have the same love that he had. The same love for other people. That we can be gathered here together in a congregation and, and have this same type of love, being in one accord, being of one mind, being of one spirit. And, and you know, um, it says here, if any have comfort of love, if any fellowship of the spirit. I really want this church, as small as we are, just to be really rock solid as a church. Uh, where, where, where people are friends with each other, we're thinking about each other and doing things for each other and trying to reach more people as well. But um, let's keep reading here. Verse number three says, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. This has been a common theme lately in my preaching, but it's super important that we can remain humble. And we're always thinking about other people. That's the only way we're going to be. Actually, you know, and with this morning, I talked about getting rewards, right? It's interesting. The best way for you to get rewards for yourself is to be humble and to not be thinking so much about yourself, but be thinking about the cares of other people and esteeming other people better than yourself. If you remember all of the things that we talked about this morning, had to do with, you know, we talk about having a feast for people who are in need, people, you know, needy people, uh, uh, the maimed, the poor, the blind, and helping people out like that. Well, in order to even do something like that, you need to be esteeming other people as being important and you need to kind of lower yourself and say, hey, I need to do something for these people. I want to help them out. It's interesting how that works out. But let's keep reading here. Verse number... 4 says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. We shouldn't be worried about having this great reputation of people looking up and admiring you and everything else. Be a servant. That's what Jesus Christ made himself, a servant. People don't look up and admire and set up on a pedestal a servant, right? But that's what Jesus came to be. And who would um, deserve any better um, acknowledgement than Jesus Christ himself? But this is what he did. This is the mind that he had. Verse 8 says, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, these concepts are going to be applied for, for making friends with people and being a good friend to them. Philippians 2, look at verse 13. The Bible says, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. 
Jump down to verse 17. It says, Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your estate. So you see the care that the Apostle Paul has for these people, for the, for the, the church at Philippi, right? He's saying, if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. So they're, they're, they're having a, a, because they're of one mind, they're rejoicing with each other um, because of their sacrifice, because of the work they're doing. But look what it says in verse 19. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy shortly unto you that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. He's saying, I want to know how you guys are really doing. So I'm going to send Timothy over there to check up on you, to make sure you're doing well. And he's doing it because he honestly cares for these people. It's a thought, and it's not just a thought in his mind. He's actually you know, going above and beyond just thinking about people. He's actually doing an action of like sending someone out there, hey, go out and help these people. Go out and see how they're doing and, and bring me word back again and, and so I know what their state is, so I know what's going on with them. He says in verse 20, For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ's, but ye know the proof of him that as a son with the father, he hath served with me in the gospel. He's saying, look, most people, like, like basically everybody does not have this same mind who will naturally care for your state. That's why he chose Timothy to send. He says, Timothy is different. Timothy's not like everyone else who basically isn't going to care. He doesn't care, you know, everyone else, they don't care about you. They don't care how you're doing. They don't care about anything like that. He says, they all seek their own. He says, but not Timothy. He says, you know the proof of him. Timothy is someone who learned and studied under Paul. He got saved and he studied and learned under Paul. He says, that's why he says, as a son with the father, he hath served with me in the gospel. He's like, I know this guy. He's a good guy and he's going to care for your estate just like I do. And he's sending Timothy unto them to know how things are going. And, you know, we need to, to not have the callous attitude of who cares about these other people, especially when we're talking about other brothers and sisters in Christ or people within the church and have a callous attitude. Say, oh, yeah, that person, they're always sick. Oh, they're so needy. Oh, all this other stuff. Look, you ought not to have that attitude about people in the church. We ought to care enough for people and to be willing and to be thoughtful enough to go out in advance without them ever having to ask you to do something for them, but to say, you know what, I'm going to do something nice for them. I'm going to care about their estate. I'm going to go over there and see how they're doing. That's why we stopped over there last week to see how one of the members of our church was doing because they haven't been around and I try to keep in communication with people, but look, this is something that we all need to be doing. This isn't just the job for the pastor. This is for everybody. We all ought to care enough for other people within the church and befriend them and try to be a friend of them by doing nice things for them and thinking about them specifically and saying, you know what? I know I have a lot of things going on in my life. I know I have a lot of other stuff going on, but that person needs some help and I'm going to help them out. We may not be, you know, have all the most finances in the world. We may not have all this other stuff, but at the very least I can maybe make a little bit extra food for them. I could pray for them. I can, I can let them know that we care about them. I could send them a message. I could call them up on the phone. There's lots of things we can do for the people within our church to be a friend to them. Timothy was that type of a guy. Timothy was someone that Paul could trust because he said, hey, he's worked with me. And we see through all the epistles of Paul the type of, of guy Paul was. I preached on a camping trip about, um, you know, at the end of the book of Romans, Romans 16, where he just lists off all of these people. And he's saying, greet this person, greet that person. Hey, this person labored with me. And he knows all of these different people by name. Because he cares about them. Because he get, takes a chance to get to know them and then thinks about them and prays for them and says, hey, you know, tell this person I said hi. Tell them I'm thinking about them. Greet this person. And he knows Lots of people. I mean, look at, look at the amount of Christians that the Apostle Paul knows. He knows a lot of people. And we can see the type of attitude and the, and the humility that he had, but not just the humility, but the, the care and the love that he had for other people. 
Now, he loves them enough to rebuke them and tell them when they're wrong, as in the case of, of Corinthians, the first Corinthians, when he had to just rebuke them sharply on, on multiple matters. But he also loves them enough to be able to, to supply their need. He says, hey, you know, he was trying to be a good example when he could have been burdensome unto these people and say, and collect some kind of income, collect some kind of money based on the work that he was doing for them and preaching of the gospel and everything else. He said, you know, I didn't do that. I labored night and day. He said, travailing night and day that I might not be chargeable unto you. He said, I worked with my hands. I worked a job and I did all the rest of this work for you just to show you that I care about you, I love you, and this is an example and you need to be a hard worker too. That's the type of guy that Paul was. And he sends Timothy unto Philippi saying, okay, you know what, I want, I care about you too. And so I'm sending basically my best guy because these other guys aren't going to care. They're not going to do the same job that Timothy will. So I'm going to send him to check on your estate. <clears throat> we need to be good friends. Now, turn if you would to Job because sometimes a good way of understanding how to be a good friend is also understanding how, you know, how not to be a bad friend. Job's friends are a great example of what not to be like if you're going to be a friend to somebody. This is how you do not act with your friends. Turn if you would to Job chapter 13. We're going to, we're going to read a few, a few verses here out of a few different chapters from Job. And um, we need to make sure that we are not being like Job's friends, especially when friends um, fall on hard times, when friends have problems. Because that's when you need a friend the most, honestly. When you are going through a struggle, when you are going through a hard time, that is when it is really important to have good friends. Now, we always ought to have good friends, but you know, when, when things are going well and things are going fine, you know, friends are great, but, but the, the time when you are in need is, is the time when a friend is a friend indeed, right? And that's, that's part of the reason what, what friends are for. They're supposed to be there for you, to help you, to comfort you, and, and to be there for you when, when you need them. Job 13, look at verse number 2. He says, what? He says, what ye know, the same do I know also. This is Job speaking. What ye know, the same do I know also. I am not inferior unto you. Surely I would speak to the Almighty, and I desire to reason with God. But ye are forgers of lies. Ye are all physicians of no value. Oh, that ye would altogether hold your peace, and it should be your wisdom. So there's a sharp rebuke from Job to his friends, saying, look, you're a bunch of liars, and you're physicians of no value. You're like this doctor that charges you all kinds of money and you have zero value. He says, oh, that you would all together hold. He says, like, I wish you would just be quiet. If you, at least if you would not open your mouth, people might think you're wise. He says, that would be to your wisdom. Uh, turn, if you would, to Job chapter 8. Job 16, 2, he says, I have heard many such things. Miserable comforters are ye all. Again, Job rebuking his friend, saying, look, you're miserable comforters. You're not helping me at all. You're not comforting me. You're not helping me in my time of, of extreme distress and, and despair because they actually attack him. He says in Job 16, verse 20, he says, My friends scorn me, but mine eye poureth out tears unto God. His friends, so why, why, was he, why was Job so upset as his friends? Why was he rebuking them sharply and, 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 and just saying how horrible and miserable they were and physicians of no value and all this stuff? Well, look at Job chapter 8, verse 1. This is only part of it. Now, we can read like the entire book of Job and where his friends are answering him and you'll be able to see why his friends were so bad. But this is just one highlight of what they were doing because basically the, the, the synopsis of what they were doing is saying, Job, all of this stuff happened to you because of your own wickedness, because you have some secret sins, because you know, you're not righteous, you're not living right with God. So this is just proof. This is just evidence that, that God came down on you to punish you for something you did that's wrong. Now, we know that that's not the case. God was actually, you know, boasting about Job saying, look, you know, to Satan saying, hey, is there, you know, there's none upright like Job in all the land. He's an upright guy. He's a stand-up guy. He's true to his word. He's a man of integrity. And it was Satan that attacked Job. But his friends, 
just took it and said, oh, well, you must just be in sin. You must have something wrong with you. Job 8, verse 1. Look at what it says. The Bible says, Then answered Bildad the Shuhite and said, How long wilt thou speak these things, and how long shall the words of thy mouth be like a strong wind? Doth God pervert judgment, or doth the Almighty pervert judgment? He's saying, who are you to say, you know, like, basically what he's saying is the judgment of God is upon you, and what, are you going to say God's justice is perverse? He's saying, you know, you deserve this stuff. You ought not to be justifying yourself because obviously God is judging you. This is what he's saying. But look at verse number four. He says, if thy children have sinned against him, and he have cast them away for their transgression. If thou wouldest seek unto God betimes and make thy supplication to the Almighty, if thou wert pure and upright, surely now he would awake for thee and make the habitation of thy righteousness prosperous. He's saying if you truly were righteous, God would awake right now and make things right for you. But what a horrible thing to say. Don't look, Job lost all of his children. They all died. He lost all of his substance. But what type of a horrible thing is that to say? These friends came. The whole purpose of them to come to Job is to comfort him, is to help him out. Now, even if he was incorrect, which he wasn't, he was right in everything that he said. If you're going to be his friend at his darkest hour, in his worst time, all of his children are dead. What in the world are you doing saying, if your children have sinned against him and he have cast away for their treasure? saying, well, your children were in sin. That's why God killed them all. And he's saying, if, if you would have, you know, sought God early, which means, you know, betimes, and make thy supplication to the Almighty, Job was doing that. The Bible records that Job was, was giving a sacrifice daily for his sons. He said, well, just in case they did something, just in case they sinned against God and didn't realize, just in case they did this, he was offering. He loved his kids and he cared about them. And now his friends are coming after they're all dead and saying, well, pff, yeah, I mean, they must have been sinners. You know, it's these great sinners that God had to destroy. Like, God wanted to destroy them, but they weren't sinners. What kind of a... That, that's why you can see now why you're saying, like, they're miserable comforters. They're physicians of no value. They just need to shut up because they're, they're not comforting them at all. How is that a comfort to someone who's going through such a hard time? That is not what a friend is for. A friend is not there to start pointing out problems with you. Even if, and that's what I said, even if Job was, was not right in what he was saying, let's say Job had some sin, and they're just going to keep on rebuking him and say, look, at that moment in his life when everything has been destroyed and is lost, be a friend to that guy. <laughs> just be there for him, you know. Hear him out. Console him. Comfort him. Be his friend. But no, but Job was righteous anyways, which, is even, which made it way worse for these guys because they kept thinking that this is God judging them, and it wasn't at all. It wasn't God's judgment. It was an attack from Satan. But turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 17. Proverbs 17. We're going to see some, some words of wisdom from Proverbs about friends, some, some uh, good verses about being a good friend. Proverbs 17, verse 17 reads, a friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. If these people were truly friends of Job's, they would have been loving him at all times. Not just in his good times, because remember, Job had a lot of riches and stuff too, so yeah, I'm sure they were real good friends with him and buddy-buddy when he had the wealth, right? And when they could come over to his house and, and he could probably feed them and, and whatever else, take care of them. Yeah, sure, they were real good friends at that time, but a real friend is going to love at all times. Whether you're in abundance or whether you don't have abundance. Proverbs 18, verse 24, just one chapter over. Proverbs 18, verse 24 reads, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. So I've heard this preached before, and I, not that I think it's incorrect, but it's saying, you know, if you want to have friends, you should be friendly to other people. But I, I mean, that's not, that's, that's not what this verse is explicitly saying. It's saying, if you have friends, you need to show yourself friendly. It's not in order to get friends, but not that that's a bad way to get friends either. But look, if you have friends, 
You ought to be worried about showing yourself friendly unto them. Be an asset unto them. Don't, don't have friends thinking, well, what can my friend do for me? And then I'll just, I'll kind of keep in my life long enough to be able to just use them for whatever I need them for. That's not what a friend is about. A friend is there. You're, you should be a friend to other people. You should be the one that's friendly to them and not worry about what you're going to receive in return. It says here, there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Having good friends is a good thing. Someone who's going to stick closer to you than a brother. I think of the friendship from this verse that was between Jonathan and David. The Bible says that their souls were, were knit together. It was, it was like, I mean, they had this great friendship where they really cared for each other. They loved for each other. And they were, they were friends like until death, basically. They, would, you know, they made these vows to each other of, of not, you know, that, that David wouldn't, wouldn't um, wipe out Jonathan's family and stuff like that, you know, because there was the whole issue of the kingdom. And Jonathan knew that David was going to get the kingdom. But they were such good friends that they didn't let that get in the way of their friendship. And um, turn, if you would, to Proverbs 27. But here it says, there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. I believe that's the type of friendship that Jonathan and David had. That, you know, of all of David's brothers, Jonathan probably would have stuck closer to him than anybody else and stood up for him, which he did. He did to his father Saul. He was constantly sticking up for David and trying to intercede for him and do the right thing. And that's the, the, the same way that we need to be and find a good friend and be friendly towards other people and be there for them so that even if they have nobody else, you can be a friend unto that person. Proverbs 27 verse 5 says, open rebuke is better than secret love. He's saying basically it's better for someone to tell you you're wrong openly than for someone to love you and not tell you a word, just to just have a secret love. I mean, you have no idea that person loves you. You say open rebuke is better than secret love. Verse 6 says, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. So, Sometimes your friend can say things to you that, that might hurt, you know, especially if they're trying to tell you the truth. And as a friend, you ought to be able to tell another friend the truth you, because you want to help them. You want to see them grow. You want, to, you want to see them get right with God or whatever the issue may be. And sometimes that may come across as a wound. But don't let that destroy your friendship. You know, we all ought to keep, again, keeping the humility Keeping that humbleness, that humble mind, that humble heart, that you're not going to have your pride hurt because a friend has decided to tell you about something that maybe you need rebuking on or that you ought to change. And the proud person's going to say, well, what do I need this person for? When really, they're trying to help you. And it may sting a little bit when it happens, but you need to realize that that person actually loves you and you know, it says, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of you, because you can find people who are just going to kiss up to you, right? People who are going to tell you everything you want to hear, and they'll, they'll, they'll butter you up, and they'll, they'll be flattering, right? But that's why the Bible says, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. They're not your true friend. They don't care about you. They may be able to say these things, but ultimately, they're just looking for whatever, however they could benefit. So that's, you got to watch out just because, you know, your enemy is, you know, is, is quote unquote, giving you kisses, the kisses of an enemy. It doesn't make him no longer your enemy. Right? So just be aware of that. A true friend will be able to, to tell you, um, you know, give you rebukes when needed. Uh, jump down to verse number nine. The Bible reads in Proverbs 27, nine, ointment and perfume rejoice the heart. So doth the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty counsel, thine own friend and thy na father's friend, excuse me, forsake not. Neither go into thy brother's house in the day of thy calamity, for better is a neighbor that is near than a brother far off. Again, talking, just stressing the importance of having friends. He's saying, don't forsake your friends. Don't get so busy, you have no time for your friends and just, just have nothing to do with them. He says, your friend, your father's friend, you know, family friends, keep them as friends and um, don't forsake them. And, you know, friends are important. Again, we see another time of need 
at the latter part of verse 10, neither go into thy brother's house in the day of thy calamity. Calamity is when you have a lot of problems, right? There's a lot of issues, things going on, and you're in trouble. You're in calamity. He's saying that's what your friend is for. For better is a neighbor, neighbor referring to the friend in the earlier part of this verse, better is a neighbor that is near than a brother that is far off. So, you know, your friend can be even better unto you than your own family. So we need to make sure we have good friends that we can rely on and that we are being, even more importantly, being, being good friends to other people so that they can rely on us. Proverbs 27, look at verse 17, jump down a little bit. And I've heard this taught different ways as well. But um, the Bible says, Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. And I've heard this used many times where people trying to say, oh, iron sharpens iron, about like, you know, gaining more knowledge with having, you know, godly friends. Now, but what this is, what this is really saying, it says, as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. The countenance is his face, right? A friend is there to, to comfort and to lift up and, and, you know, help the countenance of his friend. Help their face, help their mood, help to bring them um, up when they're down, right? That's what a friend is for. The same way that iron sharpens iron, that's what a friend's duty is, is, is to help to comfort others. Now, we're admonished in many places in the Bible to be a comfort to others. Turn, if you would, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And while we're reading these scriptures, you know, like I said, this may not be new knowledge. This may not be something that that is groundbreaking or earth shattering and, and wow, I never saw that before in the Bible. But that's not the point of this sermon. The point is to just help you evaluate where you're at and, and how you can be a better friend to other people based on the scripture, based on what the Bible is telling us how we ought to be and how we ought to act and the things that we ought to do. One way to, to, to get it across is think, just put yourself in, in, on the receiving end of this and think about how much you in, enjoy having a friend such as one that's described in these verses that we're reading. How much would you love to have a friend like that? And as much as you'd love to have a friend like that, that's the friend that you need to be. Look at verse 11 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. The Bible reads, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together, and edify, edify means to build you up, and edify one another, even as also ye do. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you, and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. Comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and all men. Verse 14, again, it says to comfort the feeble-minded. You know, the simple, the, the people who have, who, who have a hard time uh, grasping some things, they need to be comforted. And it says to support the weak. There are a lot of aspects of our Christianity and helping people out. And I know I'm focused mostly on, on being a friend today, but we need to be able to show ourselves as being a friend to people who have no friends, to people who are, you know, you know now I'm kind of talking about outside of our church even. Right? It's important to do within the church, but we need to be able to reach out to people. And that's why, you know, for a long time when I was a faithful ward, I, uh, I ran a nursing home ministry. And what a great experience that was. I had an opportunity to make and become friends with people who literally had no friends and they had no family visiting them. It was like this, this ghetto rest home that was probably the people in there was all like just government funded because they didn't have anything else because they didn't have any money. It's not like 
from what I could gather, you know, their family wasn't paying for them to be there. They had nobody to take care of them. Most of these people didn't even have relatives to come and visit them. They would often be sent to these places because there's nowhere else for them to go. They required care and they would go and end up dying in these places. I mean, there's people and the care there was not that great. The level of care was, was pretty pathetic. There were four people to a room and it always smelled in there and you know the food wasn't good and the care was not that good. And there were people there that seemed pretty alert and pretty active and, and pretty okay and then like a couple weeks later they're dead. Very sad state. These are very poor people, very poor condition but having the opportunity to go in there and to make friends with some of these people was, it was a blessing for me. Because I got to, to go in there, someone, you know, often there were some people that would look forward to it. I'd bring my girls and, and it would lighten up their day to, to just have somebody to care about them and to talk to them. Even if it is just for a few minutes, if it's just five or ten minutes or whatever, it means a lot to them. And this is the way that we ought to be and, you know, it, in general as Christians. We ought to have this type of an attitude and you know think about that for yourself on how you can benefit someone else. I know that our time is limited but being a good friend re re requires sacrifice. A little bit, even if it's just a little bit of sacrifice. How, whatever you're willing to do, think about what you're willing to do and how much time you have and how much time you can sacrifice to help other people out and to be a friend to somebody else. This is, this is part of what we're being called to do. This is part of who we should be as Christians. Turn, if you would, to 1 John chapter number 4. I'll read from you from Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews 10, 24 reads, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a matter of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. We need to be as a church, you know, provoking one another unto love and to good works. These good works, yes, the soul winning is huge and I'm never going to downplay the soul winning, but that's not it. That's one of the reasons why I preached the sermon I did this morning about earning rewards. Rewards is based on work work. We need to provoke each other to good work. One of the works is going to be helping other people out, yes, with the gospel, but also being a friend to them, comforting them, edifying them, doing things for other people, that especially people who are in need. 1 Peter 3.8 reads, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, Love as brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. This is what God calls you. Have compassion on other people. When, when one person's suffering and going through a hard time, we all ought to be suffering with that person and, and offering to help in whatever way that we can. We are a church that where people, individuals, have had their own problems already. And we're a small, young church. But we have members that have serious issues. And they need to be cared for. And they need to be helped. And they need whatever it is that we can do. And now listen, a lot of people will not come to you with an issue and say that they have a problem or say that they need help. That's the way a lot of people are. I'm probably the exact same way. If I needed something or needed help, I would, you know, other than maybe asking my wife, I probably wouldn't ask anybody else for anything. It doesn't mean that I that in certain times I wouldn't be able to be, be use, you know, be able to use help and be very needful to have help. So what I'm saying is that, you know, I'm not saying I need help right now. I'm saying that people who do need help oftentimes won't ask for it. So don't wait for someone to ask you to help them. And now look, I know, you know, it's hard to know what does somebody need? What is it that I could truly help with when no one says anything? We need to get a little bit creative and think, how can I help this person out? And some people aren't, aren't as ashamed to ask for help. 
you know, thankfully, but, but there are others that, that, that they'll never ask you for help. We need to figure out how we can be a good help unto people. How we can help them in their times of need and have that compassion and to love them as your own brother because they are your brother in Christ or your sister in Christ. To love them in that manner and care for them, pray for them, be pitiful, and to be courteous. You're in 1 John chapter 4. Look at verse number 7. 1 John chapter 4. Having this love for each other is inseparable from loving God and having this love of God. We see this in 1 John 4, look at verse 7. The Bible reads, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and His love is perfected in us. Jump down to verse number 20. The Bible reads, If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. So if you want to see, come to church and say, yeah, I love God, and I want to serve God, I love him, but you don't have that love for your brothers and sisters in Christ, you're a liar. The Bible says you don't love God. Because God loves your brothers and sisters and God loves people. And if you're not showing that love for others, then you don't love God. Flip over chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. You're in chapter 4. Look at chapter 5, verse number 1. And ask yourself, how much do you really love God today? Verse number 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. The Bible says that everyone that loves God, lo that loveth him that begat, says they also love that is the, him that is begotten of him, other people who are saved. If we're going to say that we love God, then we have to. You cannot separate it. We have to love other saved people. And this is what we need to make sure we have because if we don't, if we don't have that love of other saved people, then we don't really love God. And there's no other way to interpret this. And he also said that if we say we love God, we need to keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. Now, as I mentioned before, this sermon ties in perfectly with this morning's sermon. A good friend is going to be one that ministers unto others and does the work to help people out. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews 6, the last place I'll have you turn this evening. Hebrews chapter 6. Helping others is the best way to, to show your friendship and really just to be a friend unto others. Hebrews 6, verse number 9 reads, But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward his name, in that... You have ministered to the saints and do minister. So look at that. We were talking about working this morning and receiving rewards and receiving, you know, righteous, uh, or receiving rewards and recompenses based on our work. Verse 10, Hebrews 6 says, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor. God's not going to forget about it. He's going to see it. And what work is, is he talking about? He says, In that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. Minister means you are helping out the saints. You are doing work and helping 
other people out. The Bible says God sees that. God sees your work in helping out these other saints that need help. He sees you ministering to them, taking your own time, your own energy, your own effort, your own resources, and saying, you know what? I'm going to use this all to help you out. I'm going to be a good help for you. God sees that, and God will reward you for that. God will not, he says, God's not unrighteous to forget your work. It's not like he just forgets about that stuff. He sees it. And, that's, and, and again, it's, 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 it's amazing how this works because if you ultimately, if you, if you, are, if you truly are self-centered and you want what is, what is ultimately going to get you the most for yourself, the best way to achieve that is to not think about yourself at all and think about everybody else completely. That is the best way to do it. You have to be completely selfless and worry about other people and esteem them better than yourselves in order for you to receive the most things of la rewards of lasting value. But let's keep reading here. It says, And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. Look at that. Ye be not slothful. Slothful means lazy but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. It is work to help people out. It's work to be thinking about other people. Even to be praying for them is work. To be doing things for other people. But God sees the things that you do and He will reward you for it. You know, I thank God. I have a lot of great friends. I really do. And I praise God for that. Some of my best friends are actually, you know, they're other pastors. They're preachers. They understand. They get it. And, and I love even just looking to them for examples for myself. I've got a couple of pastor friends that are, that are calling me and texting me. And look, I know how busy they are because I know how busy I am. But they take the time to communicate with me and to see how I'm doing. And you know what? That goes a long way for me personally. That is a huge comfort to hear from other people just saying, even if it's just, hey, brother, I, I, got, I got a text last night, late last night that just says, hey, brother, I just prayed for you. That's great. That's a great friend. That's someone who's taken time out of their busy schedule to say, you know what? I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to do what I can. You know, this person lives very far away. There's not much for him to do to help out with anything here. But you know what? If he were here, he would do it. If, if there was a need, he'd help out. Great friend. And I know it's not just me either. They're doing this to a lot of people. And that's one of the reasons why I believe they're pastors. Because they have that heart to love for and care for other people. But it's not just the pastor's job. I mean, the pastor should be someone that has that type of an attitude. But it's not just for the pastor. It's for everybody. It's all of us need to have this same level of love for each other and to, to, to befriend others, especially, I mean, other people who are saved, other people in the church, other people who are born of God. We ought to be loving them as ourselves. So I want to challenge you to be a friend, to make a concerted effort throughout the week, throughout the month. And I've done this once before, but I want, I want to do this again to make an, a concerted effort to consciously be a good friend to somebody, to somebody else. To think about some, some person that you think might have a need and how you might be able to help them and, and, and do something for them. Take it upon yourself to work it into your own busy schedule to pray for someone and to at least check on their well-being and to let them know that you care about them at the very least. At the very least, if you can do that, I want to challenge you to do that and to be a blessing to somebody else. And hopefully we, could, we can work on this to be a pattern of things that we are doing regularly and looking out for each other. Now look, do I think this is some problem in this church? No. I love everybody in this church and I think there are a lot of good friends. I consider everybody in this church a friend of mine and a good friend. But we need to make sure that we're not getting 
oh, what's the right word? Just dismissive and, and, and kind of brushing people off or getting bitter or getting a, a, an attitude of someone a, a, you know, against other people that, oh, well, they always seem to need help. And then, and then having a negative attitude towards that person when you say, oh, well, it's real inconvenient for me to have to help this person out. Instead of having that type of a mindset, we need the exact opposite of that. Because that's not the mind that Christ had at all. We're all very needy people, when it, especially when it comes to our salvation and it comes to everything. I am constantly asking God for things, for help with things. I'm a very needy person. And I thank God that He's not in heaven saying, oh, there's Pastor Burzens again. What does, he, what does he want? What does he need? Right? But rather, he likes to hear from us. We ought to have, you know, the same type of an attitude. The same type of love. Same way I care. Well, we're not so worried and we're put out and, oh man, it's hurting. Nah, I bet they're probably going to want something else this week. Love that person. Be a good friend to them without them ever even having to ask you. I want this church to be a church that practices pure religion as defined in the Bible. People like to toss around that word religion as if it's a cuss word these days. But we are a church that's going to practice the pure religion as defined in James chapter 1, verse 27 that reads, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. That's pure religion. Visiting the fatherless. Visiting the widows. Visiting the people who have nobody else. Paying them a visit. Caring about them and loving them. And preaching the gospel unto them. And keeping ourselves unspotted from the world. That is pure religion. That's the religion that I want to follow. And that's the religion that this church is going to follow. So let's, um, let's take it upon ourselves. Take up the challenge to just, at the very least, like I said, just, just contact somebody. Let them know that you're thinking about them. Pray for, well, honest, first of all, honestly, pray for them. And then let them know that you prayed for them. Let them know that you care about them. Let them know that you're thinking about them. Or even do more for them. Whatever. Whatever is in your heart. You know, I don't want to be someone who's like, for, you know, we don't have rules here. I got to force you to do anything. Okay? But I'm going to try to teach you the Bible. And the Bible is telling us that this is the type of heart and attitude that we need to have. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the love and compassion that you've had on us. The mercy, the long suffering you've extended unto us, dear God. Help us to be able to, to have those same attributes and qualities in our own self, in our own spirit, dear God. And help us to be able to be a good help and a good friend unto everyone else in this church and other, other people as well, dear Lord. Especially the um, other believers, dear God. Help us to be reminded, be remindful, to be mindful of these people, dear Lord, of, of other people. Not just thinking about ourselves. But um, I know we have very busy lives, but help us to be able to make the time for ourselves to set apart even five minutes a night or five minutes in the morning to just dedicate to, say, prayer for, for individuals or um, you know, a time where we can at least reflect on other people and think about what their needs may be and how we might be able to better help them, dear Lord. Help us in our own sacrifice in this matter and to have the right heart of love and compassion that you've had, that we might have the mind that was also in Christ, dear Lord, of this, of this type of love and compassion. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.